I would like to say a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Merve Ispahani. I'm the Academic Programs Coordinator at Columbia Global Centers Istanbul. Today, we're delighted to host uh, three brilliant young scholars who will uh, present us their works on water, sewage, and horses, uh, the infrastructure of Istanbul, our second uh, webinar in the series. Before we start, I would like to say that as the Columbia Global Centers Istanbul, we are honored to bring this webinar series, Voices of Emerging Scholars, to you under the leadership of Professor Zeynep Çelik, a distinguished scholar of Ottoman Empire, who has inspired and raised many students in the field. Zeynep Çelik is a distinguished professor of Ottoman and Middle Eastern history and architecture at New Jersey Institute of Technology and an adjunct professor of history at Columbia University. Her publications include the remaking of Istanbul, a winner of the Institute of Turkish Studies Book Award, Displaying the Orient, Urban Forms and Colonial Confrontations, Algiers on the French Rule, Empire, Architecture and the City, French Ottoman Encounters, 1830, 1914, which is also the winner of the Society of Architecture Historians Bureau Cost of Book Award in 2010, about antiquities, politics of archaeology in the Ottoman Empire, as well as um, Europe Knows Nothing About the Orient, uh, a critical discourse, 1872-1932, forthcoming in April 2021. We believe in the importance of creating ongoing scholarly conversations on global scale, and we cannot wait to hear uh, more about the research of our guest speakers today. Let me leave the word to Professor Celik uh, to introduce you, our panelists, and today's program on the infrastructure of Istanbul uh, during the 19th century. Thank you very much for joining us. Let me start by welcoming you to our second webinar and by reiterating my thanks to Ipek Cem Taha, the director of the Columbia Center in Istanbul, who cannot be with us today, as well as to Merve Tezcan de Isfahani, my indispensable colleague in this venture, and Sedan Gürlek, our organizer extraordinaire, who also designs the posters. Talking about the posters, um, I would like to uh, spend a, a couple of minutes on the photograph we used in the current poster. And we are grateful to Cheryl Misbani for the image. This is not just a pretty picture. Of course, it summarizes visually the two main themes of the seminar water and horses. Uh, sewage is underground. We don't see it in any photographs. The photograph also says quite a bit about other things. For example, patronage. Abdulhamid's Tura and the dedication dominate the fountain design in an imperial branding gesture. The ostentatious architectural veneer is stuck on an old wall creating an unsettling contrast, which can be read as a metaphor on the nature of interventions to the city's fabric. We also catch a glimpse of the everyday use of the fountain, neighborhood people waiting in line for their turn to fill their containers, some showing impatience, like the young girl, the second from the right. They accentuate that an important public service was provided by the Sultan, albeit in a rather ceremonial and self-congratulating manner. I will leave it to you to come up with scenarios about the horse and the uh, owner. Now a few words on the uh, overarching theme. Scholarship on Istanbul's history has commonly focused on the built forms and the image of the city. And this is really true of all periods. Uh, in addition to the multiple forces that produced them. The three papers we will hear today will expose us to another Istanbul. 
a city working hard in the late 19th century to maintain its essential daily needs. Provision of drinking water, creating a hygienic system to handle its waste, and searching for an efficient way to transport its residents. As we will see, they all came with their own set of problems. The investigation of these basic urban functions opens new windows onto the life of ordinary Istanbul blues and allows us to hear their voices. It is worthwhile to underline the archives our presenters consulted for a whole range of documents, which include regulations, reports, official decisions, petitions, maps, plans, and photographs. Başbakanlık Arşivi, the Istanbul University's Rare Works Library, Atatürk Library, and the National Library are familiar to all researchers of Ottoman history. Add to these the archives of the Istanbul Electric Telephone and Telephone Company, SALT, and Istanbul Research Institute, the last two very recent collections. All of these institutions digitized a considerable part of their collections. And because of that, there is some sort of an embarrassment of riches, which causes new sets of methodological challenges for scholars. Still, I cannot but envy the current scene when I compare it to my own dissertation research days in the 1980s. Two very different worlds indeed. I will now introduce the speakers. Our first speaker is Sharon Mizbani. She is a PhD student at Yale University, specializing in the comparative architectural history of the late Ottoman Empire and Qajar Iran. She focuses in particular on the development of urban water infrastructure and related monuments. She received her BA and her MA from the University of Toronto. She has also studied at Boazici University in Istanbul. Mehmet Kantel works on the urban and environmental history of late Ottoman Istanbul. He received his PhD from the University of Washington with his dissertation titled Assembling Cosmopolitan Para an infrastructural history of late Ottoman Istanbul. He is currently revising it for publication as a monograph. Mehmet is the research projects manager at the Istanbul Research Institute and the managing editor of Yıllık Annual of Istanbul Studies. His curatorial work includes memories of humankind, Stories from the Ottoman Manuscripts at the Istanbul Research Institute, 2019, and the characters of Yusuf Franco at Koch University's Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations, 2017. Mustafa Emir Küçük received his BA and MA from Boazici University, where he is currently a PhD student. Emir is interested in urban history, environmental history, and the history of children. He contributed to the cataloging of teachers' biographies from late Ottoman period at Salt Archive. He's also a researcher at Şehir Dedektifi, working on a project titled Balat Living Together. Our discussant is Michael Christopher Lowe, Lowell received his PhD from Columbia University. He is an assistant professor of history at Iowa State University and is currently a senior humanities research fellow for the study of the Arab world at NYU Abu Dhabi. He is the author of Imperial Mecca, Ottoman Arabia and the Indian Ocean Hajj and co-editor of the subjects of Ottoman international law, both published in 2020. Let us now turn to our speakers, Sharon. Great, thank you so much. 
So the title of my talk is The Art of Infrastructure, Hamidia Fountains in Late Ottoman Istanbul. On September 1st, 1902, as part of the 26th anniversary of Sultan Abdul Hamid II's accession to the Ottoman throne, a series of opening ceremonies were held in Istanbul to inaugurate the first public fountains of the recently completed Hamidia water line. The day began at noon with the opening of a new fountain in Topana neighborhood, built next to the 19th century Nusretia Mosque, not far from a larger 18th century monumental fountain that had long shaped the district's social life. The opening of this Topana fountain, as reported in the Turkish and French language press and recorded in several contemporary photographs as seen here, was attended by a crowd of municipal and palace officials, chemists and ulema, representatives from the European industries, and students from a nearby school. It was accompanied by a speech from Abdurrahman Nurettin Pasha, the Minister of Justice, who detailed the hygienic benefits of the fountain's scientifically tested water, and this was followed by prayers for the Sultan and the ceremonial sacrifice of a sheep. Lastly, Abdurrahman Pasha collected some of the fountain's water in a specially made crystal carafe before traveling to five other new Hamidia fountains around the city and presented each of their waters to the Sultan himself. Alongside the monumental Topana fountain, constructed from an Art Nouveau and Rococo styled mixture of marble and ironwork by the Italian architect Raimondo Duranco, a complementary array of smaller mass produced fountains designed by the military engineer Andre Berthier and produced by the Val d'Oz foundry in Paris were also in place throughout the city. And here on the left, we can see an opening ceremony for the marble type fountain in Nishantashe. And on the right, we see an opening ceremony for a cast iron type in Machka. In total, an estimated 126 fountains were constructed from 1898 to 1902 as part of the Hamidia Waterline Project, which collected drinking water from the Kaatane Valley and using imported steam pumps, distributed it throughout the European side of Istanbul. And this is what we see here on the screen. So um, the bottom is the Bosphorus, on the left is the Golden Horn, and here we can see the Taksim Barracks, and you can follow the red dotted line down Istiklal to Galatasaray Lisesi and down the uh, street. And at the bottom we have the seaside um, with each dot representing a Cheshme. Um, it's a little hard to see, but uh, hopefully it's clear enough. The scale of this project and the symbolic and ideological investment in it raises a number of questions, especially when taking into account increasing competition from another mode of water distribution, not public fountains, but the domestic tap water that is familiar to us today. In this map from 1888, we can see that the Hamidia water project directly overlapped with the water lines operated by the foreign concessionary company, La Compagnie des Eaux de Constantinople, which sourced water from the brackish Turcos Lake near the Black Sea coast and provided tap water straight to the homes of a select number of Istanbul's residents on the European side of the Bosphorus. And indeed, that's what we see again. So this is the Bosphorus and the Golden Horn on the left. Um, the taxing barracks, and you can follow down to Galatasaray Lisesi and down this way. The red, the pink lines show the flow of water, and each dot is supposed to represent a fire hydrant. While this mode of water consumption was not yet widely adopted among the broader population of the city, it was nevertheless offered a display, nevertheless offered a dis and displayed a particular culture of water usage one in which water was necessarily conceived as a monetized commodity to be consumed by individuals in private. Yet the Hamidia state in their 1882 contract with the French company insisted on the continued development of the public fountain form, pointing to the point of making their construction the second condition of their concessions, only preempted by the demand to supply water to hospitals, barracks, and schools. 
The scholar Noyan Dinchkal, looking at the slow and inconsistent adoption of private piped water among the population of the city and the continued usage of public fountain networks, has argued that Istanbul's water culture underwent a process of, quote, reluctant modernization, end quote, from the late Ottoman period up to the 1960s. I believe that there are some critical drawbacks to this framing, however, most notably in how this approach entails a certain teleology with the finality of piped domestic water taken as a historical given. Instead, I argue here that the Hamidia Fountain Building Project should be understood as an infrastructural manifestation of a particular regime of practices, discourses, and techniques of rule involving water what has been termed hydromentality, no more or less modern than piped water. Oops. Drawing upon the Foucaultian concepts of biopolitics and governmentality, hydromentality, as theorized by scholars in the field of critical geography, refers to assemblages of governing rationalities, techniques of rule, and ways of thinking about and defining water. Although largely deployed to describe contemporary modes of water consumption and infrastructure, hydromentality can also offer a conceptual framework to analyze historical water discourses without resorting to the teleology of the modern, pre-modern binary or the rhetorical dualism of science and spirituality. Furthermore, such an approach centers the importance of infrastructure and space in the social constitution of water and can encourage methodological connections across time and space, where, for example, in my own research, I'm able to engage with indigenous critiques of the colonial and hegemonic conceptualization of water as an abstracted and despatialized commodity. Thus, I attempt to understand the nature of hy the hydromentality instilled by the Hamidia fountains, both by analyzing the discourses within which they were embedded, such as those of hygiene, taste, charity, piety, and beauty, and by examining the structures themselves, their materiality, form, and position within urban space. The inauguration of the Hamidia water line was accompanied by the publication of two illustrated treatises, which use photographs from the imperial collections, the Turkish language Kaatane Sulare ve Hamidia Çeşmeleri and the French and Turkish Der Sadete Hamidia Menba ve Çeşmeleri Suyu, composed by the physician Besim Omer and Alexander Kambaroglu, respectively. Excerpts and revisions of these texts were also published in medical journals such as the Nefsale Afiet and the Gazette Medical de Orient. Fountains, ever since the second half of the 19th century, were the primary targets of a discourse of water scarcity in Istanbul and claims made by the beneficiaries of foreign water companies that public water and particularly public fountains were the central vector of epidemic disease. Istanbul had been struck by incidents of cholera and other waterborne diseases like typhoid throughout the 19th century, which the, with the latest outbreak ending in 1895. As scholars such as Palmier Brumet and Birsen Bulmush have noted, anxieties over cholera and its spread were pervasive in late Ottoman culture and were connected to the broader fears of social corruption and institutional decay. Besim Omer and Kambarolu responded by displaying their own mastery of hygienic science, utilizing chemical and bacteriological analyses conducted by the Levantine chemist Pierre Apéry to demonstrate that the Hamidia water was, quote, among the most pure of its type and supplied under the soundest scientific conditions. As Besim Omer wrote, public water was crucial for both the health of individual bodies and the health of human society, and that the fountains which distributed it worked to cure both the individual and social Ill illnesses. Likewise, as Cambro argued in 1907, and you can see the quote here, it was imperative that the supply of hygienic water not undermine the eminently humanitarian principles evident in the fountain form. These statements and written records help to characterize a particular hydromentality of the Hamidia Fountain Project, one in which the discourse of hygiene served to shape 
uh, interactions with the water supplied. Beyond written records, we can also look towards the structures themselves, their material form, designs, and spatiality to further probe how the Hamidia fountains defined water usage. The cast iron and marble fountains served as both functional and symbolic interlocutors between the urban population and potable water. Loading practice of water distribution with and consumption with signifiers very different from those of the domestic tap. The tura of Abdul Hamid II, seen here, um, embossed on each fountain, and the name of God originally intended to crown the cast iron type were rather clear denotations of intended popular meaning, but they also referred to a particular way of being in relationship to water that was not limited to the political relationship between subject, state, and sultan caliph. The fountain served as a site for the public exchange of charity and care in return for supplication and prayer that was absent with the privacy and placelessness of domestic tap water. Although obviously structured by Islamic notions of piety and ethics in Istanbul, it must be noted that the same foundries which produce the Hamidia fountains also produce similar found, uh, fountains in Paris, donated by the British philanthropist Richard Wallace in the 1870s. Indeed, the patronage of mass produced cast iron fountains and the hydromentality of charity and social beneficence could perhaps be seen as a broader phenomenon of the late 19th century urbanism. And here are two images of the Wallace fountains in Paris out of dozens. <clears throat> On one hand, the reproducibility of these cast iron and marble fountains, its ability to be deployed at scale, and its dependence upon global networks of manufacture and trade marked it as a new development, reflecting a new assemblage of techniques and water practices. On the other hand, the Hamidia fountain was clearly entangled with a long practice of public patronage in the Ottoman Empire and engaged with the sensorial and aesthetic understandings of this practice. As the historian Shirin Hamadeh has described, 18th century Ottoman fountains were emblematic of an architectural aesthetic of sensual pleasure visual beauty, and auditory delight. The Hamidia fountains, too, continue to be described in the language of beauty, with Besim Omer noting that the, quote, fountains had been built in a very ornate and heart-ravishing style and were both artistic and eye-catching. And we can kind of get a sense of that beauty in these photographs. Indeed, in the late 19th century, both European travelers and Ottoman elites began to conceptualize the fountain as emblematic of the Ottoman architectural style, with the Ahmed III fountain particularly valorized in treatises like the Usul Mimari Osmani, produced for the 1873 Vienna World's Fair. And you can see a plate of that here on the left, and we can compare it with uh, André Berthier, the military engineer's drawing of the Abdul Hamid fountain. Thus, while factory produced, the Hamidia fountains were embedded in this language of beauty and style, and their design reflected both practical and aesthetic considerations. To invest the otherwise utilitarian material of cast iron with late 19th century notions of beautiful craftsmanship, foundries such as Val d'Oz retained individual sculptors to produce new works in limited series. Rather than utilizing the available schematics from factory catalogs, as seen here on the left, for instance, the design of the Hamidia fountain recalled earlier on Ottoman monumental fountains through the use of analogous miniaturized details. The pointed arches, as seen here, engraved geometric and floral patterns, overhanging tiled roof, and the crescent moon finales of the Hamidia fountains represented a skeuomorphic translation of the visuality of the stone and, monument, and monumental Ottoman fountain into a new architectural medium. In this way, the notion and indeed hydromentality of water infrastructure as an aesthetic site was maintained in the Hamidia project. Central to this aesthetic experience was not just the visual beauty of the fountains, but the sensory values of taste. And here I just wanted to include a picture of someone drinking the water. 
It is not for nothing that the 19th century traveler Edward Grosvenor described the Ottomans in 1895 as, quote, connoisseurs of water as other nations are of wine, end quote. The inscription on the Topana Hamidia fountain described the sweet water, Abishirin, it provided. But Basim Omer's text testifies to an alternative evaluation of taste, even as some users of the fountains continued well into the 1960s to judge water according to the presence of a particular flavor. For him and other physicians, good water was to be defined instead by the absence of taste and odor, something perhaps we're familiar with today. The Hamidia Fountain Building Project was the archi architectural manifestation of a particular late 19th century hydromentality, which was different from the hydromentalities of individual monumental public fountains and of privatized domestic water, both of which were extant in Istanbul during the Hamidian period. The hydromentality espoused by such an infrastructure project engaged with hygienic and scientific standards for evaluating and interacting with water, but was also embedded in an ethos of personal piety, almsgiving, and healing. The Hamidia project thus represented, like other urban fountain projects of the late 19th century, a possible path for urban water distribution, one emphasizing the public, charitable, and aesthetic, rather than private, monetized, and utilitarian aspects of water delivery and consumption. As a whole scale project, the Hamidia fountains push us to think about the architecture as something not separate from the water it supplied, but rather as two elements constituting a unified sensorial experience and governed by an underlying assemblage of techniques, practices, and rationalities. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Mehmet. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, okay, uh, so my presentation is titled Pera, Kasim Pasha, Sewers and Maps, representing infrastructural entanglements in the 19th century Istanbul. <clears throat> In the 19th century, the Pera, Beyoğlu, district of Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, became an internationally recognized center of commerce, finance, culture, art, and recreation in the context of the empire's rapid integration into world capitalism. The district's built environment changed radically, manifested in the newly erected apartment buildings, arcades, gardens, and monumental hotels and embassies. Paris' rise to prominence has been studied as an experiment in municipal governance, modernization in urban space, and cosmopolitan sociability. The critical study of infrastructures, on the other hand, reveals that it was first and foremost a material process, which remade a complex and extended geography within and beyond Paris' boundaries in fundamentally unequal ways and through complex encounters between different regions, humans and animals, the past and the present, the living and the dead. The conventional narrative of Pera is partially created by physical archives. One particular kind of archival material that is frequently utilized. Um, sorry. Utilized is maps and plans of the late 19th century Pera. A critical reflection on the way we use them, I think, is helpful to understand how this archive is being constructed and reconstructed, and to offer some potential ways to deconstruct the archival frame within which the study of Pera has been limited for so long. In this piece, I first introduced Pera's 19th century sewers as a gateway to exploring the district's interconnections with its surrounding geographies. I then proposed the methodological virtues of juxtaposing infrastructural maps with insurance plans in order to show the limited frames through which urban histories have been conventionally approached, sorry, have conventionally approached the Middle Eastern and Ottoman cities in general and Pera in particular. The rise of Pera was dependent on uh, natural and ur urban resources beyond the district's borders, and this dependence in turn produced spaces and reconfigured human and non-human relations outside the district. In the 19th century, rapid urbanization, growing population, changing mentalities and sanitary concerns, especially uh, with respect to frequent outbreaks of cholera, made the efficient circulation of clean water and dirty sewage 
an essential necessity of public and individual life. In Para, this meant a growing dependence on and intensified biopolitical connections with other geographies of Istanbul. Um, the Tarkos Waterworks, as uh, introduced by Sharon, constructed by Company de Zode Constantinople, or Dersade Sushirketi, uh, began providing water to Pera in 1885, uh, with an exclusive opening ceremony symbolically held in Jardin de Petitchamp at the heart of Pera. It altered human and non-human geographies around the Tarkos Lake, and its connected waterways in the northern fringes of Istanbul. As the flow of water was intervened, villagers' access to their traditional water sources got limited, uh, the adverse effects of excess water on their lands increased, and their fishing activity obstructed, the Ottoman army, hunters, and picnickers poured into the area, mapping the environs of the Parcos as a geography of risk, as well as of natural leisure. The unequal entanglements created by this infrastructural intervention in Istanbul's countryside moved back to Pera by underlining and furthering existing inequalities among the populations residing in and around Pera, most prominently its neighboring district, the working class uh, Kasım Pasha. So here uh, is roughly where Pera is located with the port um, region of Galata here, and this is the, and the neighboring district of Kasım Pasha. The water network was concentrated in the wealthy parts of the municipal district and almost completely avoided its poorer areas. The Tarkos water created a burden on the residents of Kasım Pasha, not only through its absence in, the, in their neighborhood, but also its presence in the uphill wealthy neighborhoods of Pera, as the weight on the existing early modern sewers and cesspools had largely augmented. So in order to give a better idea of the topography that uh, I'm talking about here, um, this uphill um, buildings are all part of Pera, and we are looking from uh, the downhill Kasım Pasha. Uh, and in the middle, you can see the famous 19th, late 19th century hotel, the Pera Palace. The re relocation or complete erasure of cemeteries between Pera and Kasım Pasha, which had done a lot to absorb the rain and wastewaters coming from the uphill neighborhoods, only increased Kasım Pasha's problems as the latter had to carry the burden of Pera's increasing urban consumption by way of topography and infrastructural class politics. This created a sewage crisis for Kasım Pasha at the intersection of hygienic, public health, and aesthetic concerns, and further marked the region as the hotbed of disease and social deprivation, which for those who are familiar with present-day Istanbul has still uh, some resonance. Just as the ambition to provide Pera with the empire's first centralized water system remade Tarkos, the sewage of Pera reproduced Kasım Pasha's spaces in myriad ways. In fact, it was Compagnie de Zoo de Constantinople, the company that was mainly responsible of, um, for transforming Tarkos's environs, uh, that tried hardest to benefit from Kasım Pasha's sewage problems. During the 1880s, it proposed different schemes to undertake the planned large-scale works. What it demanded in return varied, including an extension of its concessions to operate the Tarkos waterworks, an exemption from the 2.5% uh, uh, share they were required to pay to the Istanbul municipality uh, out of their annual revenues, monopoly over the city's entire water distribution systems, and supplying of coal from the mines of Ereli uh, in the Black Sea region. Um, so here's a, a close-up of uh, the plan so that you can orient yourselves better in the map. Um, here is uh, the Pera with Galata Tower here. Here's the uh, Grand Rue de Pera, Jadbi Kebir or Istiklal Jadbi, as it is uh, not known in the present day. Galata Sarai, the uh, Lise de Galata Sarai is here. And here is the larger re region of Kasım Pasha. According to the plan submitted by uh, the company, the Kasım Pasha River was to be covered. Uh, so the Kasım Pasha River corresponds to this part. Um, from here, where Dolaptere and Barutani rivers, which Dolaptere River is here, and then Barutani is here, uh, where Dolaptere and Barutani rivers merged. The sides of the rivers were to be bleached with lime, walls were to be installed, 
and sewer conduits were to be extended into the Golden Horn that would keep the shoreline as clean as possible. And here I must say that all these rivers were in fact open sewage for uh, the uphill neighborhoods. These plans constituted the basis of another proposal that came 10 years later, this time by a German engineer, Yasmond, a professor at the Imperial School of Fine Arts in Istanbul. Yasmond repeated the observations of his predecessors that the Kasım Pasha Valley was in a wretched state in terms of sanitation due to the lack of, regular, lack of a regular sewage infrastructure, mostly caused by the uncontrolled flow of waste and rainwaters into the district's rivers. The Barutani River, again, here, was relatively clean, according to Yasmont, but its waters lost their purity as they merged with Dolaptere, so uh, at the mouth of uh, Kasım Pasha, uh, as they merged with Dolaptere, which carried the wastewaters of Feriköy, um, here, Pangaltı, and Pera. The diagnosis was once again geographically informed, and I quote from him. We see, therefore, that these districts, by leaving their fecal material in Dolaptere, turn Kasım Pasha into a foul place and a source of mephitic miasmas. End of quote. The situation became so dire, according to Yasmond, that Kasım Pasha's sanitary question became an issue concerning the entire Ottoman capital. If only the plans to directly connect Pera and Pangalta to the sea through a central sewer by passing Kasım Pasha, had been realized before. Now that Kasım Pasha had already a uh, quote unquote infected underground, such a single regulator would prove to be insufficient, hence a larger network of sewers had to be established. Thus, according to uh, this plan, Dolapter and Barutani were to be equipped with collecting sewers, whereas their convergence through the Kasım Pasha River, when they say Kasım Pasha River, they usually mean this merging uh, point of these uh, two rivers was to be completely covered and replaced by a new avenue. And here on the second uh, part of this plan, you can see it in more detail. Um, this new avenue under which the main sewage would flow, uh, which is here. Houses built on the two sides of Kasım Pasha River were to be expropriated to open the ground for the new avenue. And the lands that stood in between Barutane and Dolaptere um, here were to be reclaimed in order to create a flower garden. Alas, none of these projects were realized, and only in the 20th century, the open sewers of Kasım Pasha were closed, creating new lands for development and road infrastructure. So this part, this first part of my presentation has been an introduction to the sewage connections between Pera and Kasım Pasha. Now I would like to uh, say a few words on uh, what these maps uh, and what different kinds of maps represent for urban historians, uh, students of Istanbul, but also for other uh, cities. Two visual sources have been particularly fertile for the historians working on the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, the Dostoya map that you see on the screen of 1858-1860, uh, based on the initial findings of the six district municipalities cadastral survey, and the God Insurance Plan of 1905-1906, which was an outcome of the 1870 fire, as well as the rapid growth of the district that had prepared the grounds and the necessity for the development of the insurance sector in Istanbul. The former, <clears throat> sorry, the former has been especially helpful in order to visualize the district's spatial order um, before the radical interventions in the built environment, as well as the devastation that came with the 1870 fire. The latter, on the other end, the gold plan, is a detailed representation of the outcome of a 50 year process of modernization under the ages of novel practices of local governance, the impact of foreign companies, and the Tanzimat principles of order and reorganization, right before the empire went into its final decade of war and disintegration. In a sense, these two maps roughly mark the temporal borders of the most popular period uh, for the study of Pera, um, its Belle Epoque. I argue that they draw the contours of its spatial borders too. Back to the Dostoya map. Uh, on the Dostoya map, 
Paris borders are extended into Qasim Pasha, as you can see here, thanks to the almost uninterrupted presence of the Petit Champ de Mort or Küçük Kabristan from the hills um, stretching towards the Golden Horn. Uh, but Qasim Pasha itself is not visualized and Galata, Pera and Pangaltu are represented in a vacuum. Uh, Galata, Pera and Pangaltu. In the gold plan, the picture is more drastic. During the roughly 35 years after the drawing of the Dostoya map, the Petit Champ de Mort had almost completely disappeared. And now Jardin de Petit Champ constitutes one of the easternmost border points of Pera. Here is the little Jardin that uh, partially replaced uh, the cemetery. Without the presence of the polluted passageway granted to the cemetery, any, almost any trace of Qasim Pasha had evaporated from the representation. On the other side, Topane is represented in a terra incognita way, marked as a quartier turc, maison d'habitation en bois et en brick, even if it was part of the same administrative unit of the sixth district. In these maps and plans, Pera is abstracted from its interland and demarcated in accordance with the social and class contours. This abstraction is especially arresting if one compares them to the plans prepared for the failed proposals to cover the rivers and install a sewage network in the Qasim Pasha Valley. While the city's 19th century or earlier sewers left very few traces and unlike other infrastructural projects, very rarely photographed, these plans are important manifestations of the city's environmental and infrastructural connections. <clears throat> Especially striking is the Yasmon plan of 1893, which represents the region holistically, extended from the Golden Horn to the northern hills of the city in an interconnected geography composed along the drainage lines. Here's a better um, picture. Um, here, unlike uh, Dostoya and God plans, the topography dictates presentation. The drainage zone and the drainage zone, the drainage lines are shown with these uh, lines with uh, dots here. Here you can see. So it goes all the way from the middle of Pera, uh, right um, crossing the um, Grand Rue, the Istiklal um, Jatisi, all the way to uh, the Qasim Pasha Valley. If, um, a wider and interconnected geography is represented, made possible by environmental and infrastructural connections of river, rivers and sewers, of hills and drains, of springs and estuaries. Sewage and its visual representation follow, but also disrupt the borders created by the built environment and class manifestations in urban space. Of course, this more inclusive representation did not translate into the disappearance of the unequal power relations that were inherent in the making of this geography. Uh, what was literally as well as symbolically true in this sense was the notice of the location that you can see on the uh, bottom of the screen um, says Pera. This little note was not only an indication of where this particular map was created. These maps were created in Pera by the expertise hosted and financed in Pera to serve primarily the interests of the elites residing or working in Pera. Nevertheless, it is essential to recognize the historiographical value of incorporating them into our studies. They not only provide valuable historical information regarding the district's environment and infrastructure, their utilization also manifests, I think, a shift in our approach to the history of the district. To conclude, the infrastructural maps provide a critical perspective into the ways in which Pera's real and envisaged environmental and material interlands were illustrated and opened the way for a more complex, nuanced understanding of how its material world and connected geographies were built in the late 19th century. Of course, not all studies um, would make justified use of these sources, which is fine. What is more crucial is to open the historiography of Pera but also other Ottoman and not Ottoman cities to different forms of representations, frames and archival reconstructions to break the discursive and material contours within which their histories 
have been narrated. Uh, thank you so much. And now I pass it on to Emir for his presentation. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, my doctoral project is on the horse-drawn tramways of Istanbul from 1871 to the introduction of electric tramway in 1914 and their impact on urban fabric and society. The focus of my presentation today is the stables of the tramway company and the complaints about them. I became interested in horse-drawn trams while I was writing my MA thesis on urban parks in late Ottoman Istanbul. These parks were on major uh, tram lines. Parks are indicated with green squares on the map with P1, P2, and P3, Taksim, Tepebaşı, and Gülhane Gardens. My archival research revealed that horse-drawn tramways could potentially yield to a study that would raise a whole range of important issues, such as real estate, urban rent, infrastructural projects, local and international capital, and the condition of animals in the city. The Ottoman archive holds a considerable number of collective petitions, which convey much information about the relation between tram lines and everyday lives of Istanbulians. Moreover, the, uh, uh, as the Constantinople Tramway Company was a stock corporation owned by Ottoman and foreign shareholders, conflicts among them in the General Assembly of the company as well as the competition with other entrepreneurs would open significant economic struggles played out in the city. From an unlikely angle, the horses of the tramway company would offer insights into their uses as well living and working conditions during the reorganization of Istanbul, hence contributing to an emerging inquiry in historic studies that is animals the city. These are broader lines of my dissertation project. What I will present now uh, reflects the early stages of my research. I will discuss briefly the Constantinople Tramway Company before turning the stables and residents' reactions to their presence in their neighborhoods. At this stage, I can offer only tentative conclusions, but I will put forward some questions which I hope to address soon. In 1869, Konstantin Krapanos, a Greek Ottoman entrepreneur, established the Constantinople Tramway Company to construct the first public transportation on land in Istanbul, namely horse drum tramways. The first two line constructed between Azap, Kapı and Orteköy on the map from A to B, and between Eminönü and Aksaray from F to G in 1871. In addition to this, the Constantinople Tramway Company operated omnibuses from 1871 to 1876. The omnibus lines are indicated with pink lines. The routes of omnibuses were between <clears throat> Galata and Pangalte from C to C1 and from uh, Eminönü and Eyüp from F to F1 and Bayezid and Edirnekapı from F2 to F3. The distinguishing feature of omnibuses from tramway, tramways was that omnibus did not need rails. Tramways, however, had advantages over omnibuses. The same number of horses could pull larger vehicles as they run on metal rails with less friction than wheels on a roadway. A big problem with omnibuses was that they damaged roads due to lack of rails. The responsibility of broken roads led to tension between the municipality and the company, and eventually to the end of omnibuses. After the abolition of omnibuses, a third tramway route between Galata and Shishli with Orange Line was constructed in 1883 from C to uh, from C to E. And uh, in this line was, was extended to Tatavla in 1910 from the D. From the outset, there were two classes for passengers in the tramways, 
with a considerable difference in the ticket price. For example, the first class ticket between Azapkapı and Ortaköy was 80 para, and the second class ticket was 40 para. In addition to the differences in social standing, segregation in tramways was also based on gender. Men and women sat in different carriages, or their zones were divided with a curtain. In 1871, the tramway company had 221 horses, which were bought from Hungary. In the annual report of 1871, the board stressed that horses in the Galata or Tekoy line here traveled approximately 24 kilometers on flat topography while carrying at least eight tons. While horses on the Aksaray line were limited to carrying six tons, challenged by the need to cross slopes of five to six centimeters per meter. The care of horses was a major concern for the company as older or weaker horses lost their power and could not do their job. Hence, the health of horses and control of diseases, especially glanders, a very contagious disease among horses, was a priority for the company. City veterinarians regularly controlled the health of horses and the hygiene of the stables. Ahmet Rasim, a popular journalist and versatile author, described the tramway horses in Şehir Mektupları, City Letters, published in 1900. According to him, young and healthy horses were used first in Şişli line for three years. After Şişli, they were used in Azapkapı line for two years. Later, uh, the top couple line for one year. Finally, if horses still lived by that time, they spent their last years working in Aksara Yedikule line. It was common for horses to die by, while pulling tramway. Rasim's description points to the social inequality among urban neighborhoods with Shishli at the top of the hierarchy, benefiting from the speed and comfort of travel in trams drawn by young and healthy horses. Yedukule was at the bottom served by the oldest and the weakest horses. It also implies a three-tier classification of horses. The tramway company had three major stables. The first two, S1 and S3, were constructed in 1871 in Besiktas and Aksaray. The Besiktas stable was located between the Dolmabahce and Chiran palaces. The Aksaray stable was in the junction of the Topkapı Aksaray and Aksaray Yedikule tramway lines. The third major stable was constructed in Şişli in 1883. It was near the French hospital De La Belle. In addition, the company had smaller stables in different parts of the city. One of these smaller stables was in Devahana, which is indicated with S5, near Fatih Mosque. Journalist Basiretçi Ali Efendi complained about the manures and rotten hay, which caused much discomfort for the houses around the inn and pedestrians. In 1873, the construction of a new stable in Vefa, Şemsettin Molla Gürani neighborhood, it is indicated with S4, for the Beyazıt Edirnekapı omnibus line created tension between people living in Vefa and the company. People's complaints against the stable in Beşiktaş, for the S1, derived from the plan of the company to add a public bath into the stable rather than directly the presence of the stable. However, even if the stable in Aksaray, S3, was in a denser neighborhood, the documents about Vefa stable argued that the stable in Aksaray did not lead to any complaints. I will, I will now turn to the Vefa quarter and focus on <clears throat> the complaints about the company's stable there. The insurance plan of Vefa from 1934 does not show the location of Vefa stable, unfortunately, but uh, it should have been around Molla Shemsettin Jami Soka, Molla Shemsettin Jami Street. It should be. Uh, it should have been around there. 
these uh, three photos depict the structure of uh, WEFA, even though the date of these three photos are later than the stable in WEFA, they give an idea of urban structure of WEFA, narrow streets and residential area. After, after the construction of new stable in WEFA in 1873, people living in WEFA started to send petitions against the presence of this stable. They focused on three issues. First, one of the gates of the stable was open to a narrow street, raising the probability of accidents while horses came in and out of this gate. Second, in the stable complex, there were residences for stablemen. Neighborhood residences perceived them as a threat to their security and privacy. According to Jem Behar, neighborhoods served as important protective and cohesive units immediately surrounding the family and the household. They had their mechanisms of mutual control and surveillance to regulate public morality and their real or imagined honor and reputation to uphold. The presence of unattached and sometimes drunk single men ma made public space uncomfortable and even dangerous for women. The stable in Wefa was only about 50 arshans, approximately 34 meters away from the residential public. Third, the manure of horses and their smell were considered to be a threat to public health by the inhabitants. Medical experts in the 19th century believed that the reasons for epidemics such as cholera and typhoid were a combination of certain atmospheric conditions and petrifying field. The manure of horses was seen as a reason for air pollution, which could lead to various diseases. The Constantinople Tramway Company took some measures to improve the situation in Wefa. Firstly, it agreed to open a new gate to a wider street from the direction of the Suleymaniye Mosque and to close the gate on the narrow street. Secondly, the company proposed to limit the height of the dormitories to be under eight arshans, approximately five, six meters, to block views of the houses. Thirdly, the walls of the stable were to be raised enough to separate the compound from the neighborhood. Finally, the stable had to be regularly cleaned up from manure. Residents, however, were not satisfied with the guarantees of the company. They appealed to the Council of the State, Shurai Devlet, with the same complaints. The Council of the State deactivated the stable and established a committee to investigate local complaints. According to report of this committee, the guarantees of the company were enough to continue the operations of the stable in Wefa. Moreover, the report claimed that because another stable owned by the company in a more crowded residential area in Aksaray was fully functional, there was no reason to cancel the permission of the stable in Wefa. Citing a doctor's opinion, the council of the state argued that the smell of manure did not pose a threat to health. In brief, the council evaluated observations and reports prepared by the committee and decided in favor of the, comp in favor of the tramway company. The residents of Wefa, however, were not satisfied with what they considered to be minor improvements and sent a new collective petition to the council of the state on the 5th of March, 1874, demanding an end to the activities of the stable. The council did not change its decision. Even though the council of the state decided in favor of the company, the stable in Wefa did not last long. After the abolishment of omnibuses in Istanbul in 1876, the stable in Wefa lost its function and finally disappeared. To conclude this episode, let me remind you that horses were not new to Istanbul. Due to the rise of stables for the tramways, however, 
their presence in the city took another form and was subjected to new complaints. The new ways of using horses and their increasing numbers prompt, prompted the collective unease. My research will touch on many questions regarding the specialization of state capital relations and transformation of human animal relations with urban infrastructural projects. I would like to end with a series of questions about horses and stables opened by my research so far. For example, what were the major diseases of horses, their causes and cures? How were the manure of horses disposed? Were they used in agricultural fertility or not? How many workers did work in stables and what were their ages and origins? I hope to address these issues as my research progresses. Uh, thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for attention. Um, it's now time for um, Chris Lowell's uh, responses to these papers. The microphone is yours, Chris. All right. Well, thank you again for inviting me to, to take part in this. This was really a, a pleasure. And it's, I would also just like to say it's a pleasure to be back at Columbia, uh, my alma mater, even if only virtually, uh, and also very nice to see one of my classmates, uh, Merve uh, Tezjanla Ispahani now. Um, so just very briefly, before I offer some questions to the presenters, um, I'd like to say how much I enjoyed all of the, the three very rich papers uh, given here today. Um, in my own work on urban infrastructures in Mecca and in particular in Jeddah, I often found myself needing to figure out the state of infrastructural, environmental and public health modernization being undertaken in Istanbul to first begin to understand how these developments were transported and applied on the imperial frontier. And I can confidently say that my own book would have benefited tremendously from having uh, this research at its disposal while I was uh, still writing. Um, I, I think in many respects, this tells us a lot about the direction of the field, how far things have come. I mean, uh, Zainab uh, uh, commented on this before, just the degree to which uh, things have progressed. And I think that this is in part uh, sort of an artifact of the digitization of the archives that were uh, essentially able to reach deeper and deeper into these topics and drill down to get a sort of nitty gritty sense uh, of these urban infrastructures. And on the one hand, I would say that these papers build on or echo some very interesting work that's being done in Turkish language publications. So I would gesture to Nuran Yildirim, uh, or Ismail Yashyanlar's work uh, on cholera, Mesut uh, Ayar is another name that comes, comes to mind, uh, on water, uh, Ilhami uh, Yurdakul, uh, or on trams and transportation, Bahtetin uh, Ingen's work. Um, at the same time, this work also draws on the sort of more global English language literature on environmental and technological histories, really bringing a sort of new material understanding uh, of the Ottoman capital. In the process, I believe that these papers suggest a potent alternative to older conceptions of Ottoman and Turkish modernization focused too exclusively on constitutional, legal, and bureaucratic reform without enough attention to the modernization of things, space, built environments, and non-human actors. So to begin our questions, uh, I'd like to, to start with Sharon and Mehmet. Uh, in both of your papers, questions of hygiene, public health, and sanitary concerns hang over the discussion. Uh, as in my own work, I can't help but feel the threat of, of cholera, a kind of virtual miasma uh, sort of uh, hanging over uh, of both of these papers. Um, and really, I sort of feel the feel familiarity, right? From sewers to chemists, all of this uh, is, is eerily familiar to, to the things that I discovered uh, in my research. Um, so I'd like to hear more about how sewers and fountains, uh, chemists and microbiology, uh, or bacteriology, how these things uh, sort of fit into both the local and international crises that were sparked by repeated waves of pandemic cholera that struck Istanbul and the empire more generally throughout the 19th century. And really sort of how does cholera remake Istanbul's 
infrastructure, its hydro mentality, uh, its sort of wider landscape of public health. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I can start and then give it to Mehmed. Uh, I think, you know, what what um, the fountains do are, excuse me, so the, I think the cholera question in relation to the fountains is that cholera creates this narrative that the fountains are unhygienic. And it's really coming from both European doctors and Levantine doctors that this sort of collection of people around sometimes a single cup uh, is one of the vectors of spreading disease. And, you know, the during the 19th century, you also have a mapping of where is the cholera outbreaks happening and trying to connect it to uh, certain distribution points. I think what's happening here with the Abdul Hamid fountains is they're trying to argue against that the fountain form itself is unhygienic. And that's why you have doctors coming to test the water, you know, create these large uh, reports of how hygienic the water actually is, and sort of propose that it's not necessarily the fountain that's the problem, but the water source and using bacteriological uh, evidence to say that this is still a viable method of distributing water. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, I really liked following up Sharon's points. I really like her uh, framing of the issue as a cre creating a narrative, because I think this is true for the contemporaries, but also for historians of Istanbul. Um, while it's obviously, I mean, the presence and power of cholera is so obvious, but sometimes it's a little too obvious and say uh, easy way out for historians to uh, explain things. That is the case, for example, for the removal of the cemeteries uh, from Pera uh, that I discuss in other parts of my dissertation. Usually it is connected to the 1865 uh, sanitary, International Sanitary Conference, um, 66, sorry, held right in the middle of the cholera outbreak. And they just um, give the agency to that conference and its international attendance uh, for the removal of the cemeteries in actuality, it's a much more complicated and a much longer process. So I think it is important to um, see how it is important, how cholera is important for the contemporaries, but also for our uh, historical minds and to really qualify its uh, impact on the city. And the second point I would like to ma uh, make is cholera is also very important for the spatialization of certain concepts such as sanitization, hygiene, uh, as Sharon also hinted at. So Kasım Pasha in that sense really becomes as the center, a hotbed of cholera outbreaks. Um, but again, it has, uh, it's not the only uh, actor, it's not the only agency in the picture that it's, it's a much more complicated uh, realm that people's own political, ideological, and uh, well, um, capitalist desires go into the utilization of cholera as a um, as an explanation. I have to say, I, I'm I really like that answer. Um, I mean, one of the things that I sort of struggled with was the degree to which you had this very top-down narrative that the international sanitary conferences and the sort of European uh, membership and the board of health were constantly sort of uh, making all of these things happen around cholera. Uh, when what I think that both of you are suggesting is a sort of much more uh, bottom-up, brick-by-brick vision of how cholera reshapes the city. Um, so I want to move on uh, to Emir um, and, and sort of dig in a bit uh, to the questions of you know, human-animal interactions uh, and animal labor. Um, so uh, as a student of, of Richard Bullitt, who keep things in the Columbia family tree, uh, and having written about camel labor in my own work, I was hoping that you could say more about the introduction of horse-drawn tramways in Istanbul and how this reflects either continuity or a break with previous patterns of animal labor usage in Istanbul. So you mentioned this briefly in the paper, but surely animals, of course, were working in Istanbul long before the late 19th century. So I would want to ask what's different or new about this project? Um, what's changing in the late 19th century in terms of the nature of the presence of animal labor 
Uh, and finally, I was also hoping that you might be able to say something about this 45 year history of the horse drawn tram and how it's connected to the eventual replacement of horse drawn trams by electric tramways and how those two things might be interrelated. Uh, thank you for questions. Uh, for the first question, uh, of course, not only in Istanbul, uh, in other major cities, uh, the role of horses uh, changed in the second half in the second half of the 19th century as a uh, as a uh, as an outcome of steam engines, uh, railroads, uh, uh, and trams. They expanded the number of horses in the city, uh, and uh, for uh, Istanbul. Uh, my, according to my preliminary research uh, in the uh, 19th century and early 20th century, in addition to tramway uh, stables, most of the stables were located in Adpazarı, which is a neighborhood between uh, Fatih Mosque and Vefa district. And uh, Adpazarı literally means uh, horse market. And even, uh, um, uh, even uh, if there were some stables in other neighborhoods, residential zone, zones, uh, the number of horses was limited and their owners were someone from the neighborhood. But stables of the tramway company were constructed in different uh, locations throughout the tram line. And uh, they could be uh, near the residential zone and uh, they, uh, uh, they belong to the tramway company uh, instead of uh, individuals from the neighborhood and stable men were often uh, imported from other regions uh, into neighborhoods. Uh, so it, uh, it, it, it was a new uh, for the uh, urban fabric, the, uh, the uh, social structure of neighborhoods. Uh, for the second uh, question, uh, actually uh, electrification uh, uh, was discussed uh, for uh, before 1914, uh, but uh, for a few reasons, uh, it was postponed. Uh, the, one of the first reasons, uh, the concession on the uh, electrification of uh, uh, trams could create a tension between Ottoman government and another transportation company, the, the tunnel company, because uh, according to concession agreement between the government and uh, the tunnel, uh, the tunnel company had right over any kind of railroads based on the stationary engine in Istanbul. Uh, but the meaning of a stationary engine was not defined well and uh, government uh, uh, uh, defined uh, electric uh, in, as a con in the context of stationary engine. And for example, 1906, when the Ottoman government uh, and a tramway company discussed the electrification of trams, uh, the government thought that the electrification of tramways would violate the concession agreement uh, uh, of Tunnel. And uh, uh, the, another point, the electrification of trams required uh, uh, uh, new expropriations uh, in the tram lines. Uh, it was another reason for postponing. Uh, and uh, the last point, uh, during the uh, Balkan Wars, uh, the Ottoman army uh, bought all horses of the tramway company. In, uh, and uh, for a short time, uh, tramway company, uh, uh, tramways could not operate in Istanbul. And this situation accelerated the, uh, elect the introduction of electric trams in Istanbul. Uh, so it, it's a kind of, uh, it was a kind of a, an obligation to uh, pass the uh, uh, electric tramways. Uh, yes. Thank you for your, your answer, Emir. That was really great. Um, so I'm going to throw things to Merve. Uh, I believe that we've got lots of uh, questions from the audience that we're going to uh, get to now. Thank you, Chris, and thank you very much for your comments and questions. Um, so we, we've been receiving a really good questions from our, our audience, so maybe we should uh, start a Q&A. So uh, first two questions for um, Sharon. 
Uh, first question is about the uh, on the fountain that you choose for the poster. Uh, so one of our uh, participants asks you to you know tell us more about that image, and also another question from Hussia Zinjir. She asks as if it still exists in Istanbul. If so, where? Um, I may interrupt here. Uh, Sharon did not choose the image. We, she gave us a bunch of images and we chose that one. And the reason we chose it was because it was a very striking image and it was over the top. The architecture is so over the top top and here maybe I question Sharon's admiring words on the architecture of these uh, fountains and this one is especially over the top. So it contrasts really with that tiny outlet of water which causes people to line up. So I was trying to uh, evoke some questions to, to really trigger some questions about uh, the problems behind uh, that particular part of patronage. Where did the money go? How much money went into the architecture and really neo-baroque architecture of the particular fountain that uh, we showed on the poster? So in a way, it was meant to provoke a little bit. I think when we discussed it with Merve, we talked about the people waiting in line, which brought the neighborhoods a little bit more into the picture. And then of course the horse, what are the stories behind the horse? But this question, we're very thankful to Sharon for giving us alternatives for the poster and we chose it without consulting with her. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll just put in the chat the um, the information in the archive about the poster so you can look it up as well. And the photographs from 1888 uh, by uh, Abdullah Fred's brothers. Um, and so for the other question about do these fountains still exist, I wanna just very quickly share a few photographs I've taken. Um, and yes, they still exist either in a dilapidated state that you know no longer supply water. And this is near uh, like behind Yanijami or in Ortakoy where uh, the water does work currently. It, I think it was restored recently um, and is sort of a central figure of Ortakoy if you've been there. Um, and, you know, there's some in Yildiz Park and uh, around uh, the these sort of areas. Some were removed, some still stand. And then the, in, for the marble fountains, you can see that uh, a lot of them are in dire conditions. And actually, there is a recent article by Drashan Uryol, uh, Ur, who uh, writes about the dilapidation and restoration projects that um, need to happen for the Abdul Hamid fountains. Um, so that's the current state of them. Um, thank you. Uh, so maybe now a question for Mehmet um, from uh, Taibua Ivars Mamalı. What do you think about Bernard Lewis's words on Union and Progress Party that they have built the sewers of Istanbul? İttihatçılar Türkiye'ye anayasal demokrasiyi getirmediler belki ama İstanbul'a kanalizasyonu getirdiler. Is there a basis for this claim? Has it been validated by research on solid historical evidence? What was the role of UPP and the sewage of the city? And if they have indeed, what was the character of their project in relation with your approach to the subject? Um, this is a great question because it allows me to highlight several uh, aspects of um, the history of sewers in Istanbul. That quotation is the only quotation one can find for uh, a serious, scholar historian talking about Istanbul sewers because there's really no work on it and of course uh, Lewis doesn't research on it he didn't do any research on it but he has that um, line to for us to quote um, and it's quite difficult actually to basis uh, to to to find a basis for that claim because um, I mean not only it's not under, it's, it's not only it's un understudied, but it's also there. The sources are uh, very scattered, um, and they're only. I mean, you can only get a hint at unrealized projects because they leave 
uh, these plans and maps, but you, even the um, administrative body that is responsible of Istanbul sewers now, ISKI, doesn't have uh, good historical either information or sources for us to re receive that information. So it's quite difficult. But uh, I think what the CUP did was following some of the plans that I mentioned for Kasim Pasha and indeed covering certain uh, certain parts of open sewers. Uh, but that's only a partial uh, thing that they did. And of course, before them, there were uh, other uh, authorities who constructed sewers. Ottoman, I mean, early modern Ottomans did as well. Um, and um, in the 1860s, after the Aksaray fire, the entire neighborhood was built with modern, with the, the modern sewage system. So the CUP is not the first one, but for Kasim Pasha, there is some truth that uh, they were able to uh, cover some parts of the um, open sewers following the plans that I mentioned. Thank you, Mehmet. And uh, we can continue with uh, two questions for Emir uh, now. First question uh, is from Dimitrios uh, Stergiopoulos. Uh, so I would like to ask some questions. You mentioned that the tramway company was founded in 1871 in Karapanos. Do you know who raised the capital for this company? Also, you mentioned that the company had some problems with the authorities. Do you know which ministry was the responsible for oversighting its activities? Was this the Council of State? Um, lastly, it had to stop some of its activities in 1876. That this decision was influenced by the changes that occurred in this year. Uh, 1876 was uh, known as the year of the three sultans. Uh, thank you. Another question uh, from Aishan Gurj, also to Emir uh, Küçük. Uh, maybe this is out of focus of your work, but is there any information or data about tramway or uh, omnibus uh, travelers? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the capital of the uh, company, the, the, the, the tramway company was shareholding company and uh, uh, most of the capital uh, at the beginning came from uh, Galata bankers. But uh, later, in, in, uh, later uh, in 1898, especially after that, uh, Belgian uh, capital, uh, Belgian investors uh, dominated uh, in the uh, uh, in the company. Uh, Belgian shareholders dominated uh, uh, the company. Um, it, it, it was not the ministry actually. The the, main, uh, the problems were most of it a municipality because of the roads, uh, because uh, omnibuses especially damaged roads and uh, it, it, it was a, uh, it led to a crisis with the municipality. And the council of the state uh, was one of the last uh, decision uh, makers. I mean, uh, it's a kind of uh, court. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the second question about uh, travelers. Uh, men and women sat in different uh, carriages. I know, uh, we, we know that. Uh, of course, there are uh, Ahmed Rasim's uh, uh, writings are uh, very rich. Uh, to uh, depict the travelers, uh, but we have, at least I don't know uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, the travelers, the profile of travelers, the profile of travelers. Thank you, Emir. Uh, maybe we should continue with the general question uh, for all of our panelists. Uh, this is a question uh, from Sebastian Willard. 
Regarding the improvisation of the infrastructure in Istanbul, especially since the company is responsible for the measure seems to be French, whether there was a competition between several international uh, companies, and if the improvement of infrastructure in Istanbul was part of attempts of foreign powers to gain influence on the Ottoman capital, and if an international uh, competition um, evolved. Yeah, I guess I can begin. Um, so the French company was the first one to provide water, but there's also a Swiss company that comes in later, I think about the 1880s, um, that provides water to the Kadokoi Uskudar area. So um, uh, there's a book by Haidar Kazgan who compares these two companies and talks about their competition in Istanbul, as well as you know the practices of these capitalist companies. And I think this is an excellent question to think about, um, not just these companies within Istanbul, but they also have um, sort of arms and reaches into other cities, usually colonial cities. So when we think about, you know, what is happening in Istanbul in relation to the bureaucracy, sorry, bankruptcy, and then these companies coming in and providing the water, we can start to connect it to actually colonial practices and neoliberal practices. So um, yeah, that's an excellent question and something to think about globally as well. Thank you, Sherry. May I say a few words on this? Please. Um, thanks. Um, yes, I mean, Tycho's waterworks began by the French company in 1885. I mean, they started the operation in 1885, but the talk of bringing water from uh, some peripheral region to the heart of Istanbul, especially to Pera, began almost 25, 30 years ago. And during all that entire time span, there are different companies different local capitalists, local investors, lo different parts within the state organization and different geographies are all in competition to actually uh, realize that. Uh, so there are different companies involved uh, claiming that one particular source of water is more is healthier than another one. Uh, so there's definitely a very uh, huge competition involved that also involves state uh, stakeholders which manipulate that entire competition uh, so yeah that's for sure uh, i can say a few things uh, uh, as i said earlier belgians uh, regarding tramway company belgians were dominated actually belgians uh, were dominated um, in the world uh, in, in public transportation sector in, in 1907 a uh, new uh, in, in international or multinational companies emerged uh, uh, to compete with uh, Constantinople tramway company, uh, German and British ones, uh, and they had already operated in uh, uh, some uh, cities like Sofia and Athens, uh, uh, their uh, tramway lines. Uh, it is interesting the, the, uh, the Constantinople tramway company adopted a new different uh, discourse and they argue that uh, we are Ottoman, uh, they are uh, foreign and they are uh, dangerous for uh, uh, re, uh, organized to, uh, to uh, conducting uh, tram lines in Istanbul and they uh, start to some philanthropic activities uh, to hold their privileges, and they uh, they became successful. Thank you, Emir. Um, so um, maybe we can um, continue with two questions uh, for um, Sharon. I will read the questions very quickly. Uh, first question is from Selin Unluyanen. Um, this is about the urban context of the fountains. Do you see a pattern in how the location of the fountains account for or alter people's interaction with nearby architecture? In cases where the fountain is adjacent to a wall, do the fountains compete with the building's facade? How conspicuously are the fountains placed? Uh, the second question is from Damla Göre. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentations. Is it possible to say that domestic access to tap water 
only in the regions within the reach of company created an invisible border of difference in domestic culture within the city. Would you remark on the new hydro mentality of the era in the sense that if it included new fashions like uh, private bathing at elite or homes? And uh, Sharon, this is directed towards you, but if, if any of you, Mehmet or Emir or um, Chris, would like to comment on these questions, please feel free to do so. Yeah, thank you. I, I think also Mehmet uh, may have something to say on the second one. But for the first question, you know, it's a great question. It's something that I've been thinking about uh, and trying to sort of understand the spatial aspects of these fountains. Shirin Hamada in her book on the 18th century talks about the Maidan Cheshmasi, so the big monumental fountains where you can access taps from all side. And then also talks about in comparing it with the uh, the wall fountains, Duvar Cheshmeliri, and sort of thinking about how does that change the way you interact with the space, but also how the fountain changes the space is itself. And um, I think one thing that I'm theorizing and thinking about is the way that the wall fountains work, it kind of creates this idea of passing by. Um, they're not usually on building facades, they're usually on like uh, walls for uh, parks and things like that. So you have an idea here. But then also when you have a round fountain, so this isn't really monumental, but you can access it from all around, you sort of begin to see um, it as a social space, spaces for conversing and hanging out around them. That's definitely true for the Topana uh, fountain from the 18th century. Um, and I think it it's probably also true for the uh, Hamidia fountains of the 19th century. They become social spaces. Um, and the picture I just showed were uh, actually uh, a guild of men, part of the Sakas, who uh, take water uh, from the Hamidia fountains and deliver it to people for a small fee. Oh, yes. And for the second question, that's, you know, an excellent point. And the Terco's water, there was a joke running around at the time that it's only good for cleaning your outhouse, that the water was just so disgustingly brackish and um, just not suited for drinking. So you do see it uh, enabling uh, a culture of toilet usage, uh, baths in your home. Um, and that's sort of what the water, you know, could be used for. Um, and uh, in terms of creating social class, I think maybe Mehmet, you would want to answer that. Um, thank you. I would like to, I mean, one obvious thing is that it is first and foremost oriented for the, um, for to the service of the people who live in Para and in the palaces and in the embassies. Uh, so from the uh, very beginning, it's designed for that. Um, and that creates a division, of course. Later on, it's, uh, it's expanded towards other parts of Istanbul to the historic peninsula. Uh, and the culture of, I mean, it's quite very much connected to uh, the increased culture of water usage, private use. What is especially important in the case of Tarkos is it's a pumped water system, which allows firstly to take water to the uh, heights of Pera to the um, to places like Pera, uh, but also to the apartment buildings that are, that were rising in Pera. So the, its techni technicality also allows for a certain type of domestic living that other hydro mentalities, as uh, Sharon uh, was referring to, didn't really allow. So. Uh, that definitely created a division and invisible and sometimes actually quite visible border between different parts of Istanbul and different uh, people living in Istanbul. Thank you, Mehmet. And uh, maybe we can continue with a question both for Emir and uh, Mehmet uh, from Onur Inal. Uh, this is about use of uh, human and animal excrement excrement uh, is worth exploring. Emir has already said that uh, he has not researched the subject yet. I wonder if you have, uh, Mehmet, has any information regarding the use of uh, human excrement as agricultural fertilizer. It was common in many parts of the world until the 20th century, including Europe and the, and the US. 
Emil, would you like to say something as I open my PowerPoint? Because um... no, I, it, it, I wonder this question. I mean, it, it was one of the, my main questions. Okay. Uh, so let me just quickly show the screen. Um, I, I think have visual proof for that, um, but uh, it requires further research. If you can um, follow the sewage lines, they all in Kasim Pasha, they all correspond with orchards, with bostans. And um, I mean, I think it's quite obvious that uh, these orchards were fed by excrement uh, coming from uh, I mean, and all kinds of wastewater, of course, not only human excrement, but all kinds of wastewaters from the uphill uh, neighborhoods. Um, people, I mean, doctors, medical experts talk about this in the late 19th century, saying that it's actually not healthy for uh, the produce uh, being fed with these uh, wastewaters from different districts. But I also explore this uh, in the project I mean, in the 20th century, when these open sewers, when these rivers are got actually covered up, the orchards and bostans of Kasim Pasha also get destroyed. So I think there is a reciprocal relationship between these two ecological entities. Uh, in, in that sense, I'm talking that what the sewage of Pera made to Kasim Pasha is very productive in all of its different manifestations. Very interesting. Thank you, Mehmet. And uh, maybe uh, lastly, we can um, uh, continue with a general question uh, for all of you. Uh, this is from Sebastian Rose. Uh, I'm wondering if and to what extent uh, water systems in Istanbul worked in conjecture with the expansion of other infrastructures of communication, such as postal or um, telegraph services. I guess I can start by saying I'm not sure. Um, I, the last photo I showed of the of the Hamid fountain, you actually see um, a lamp, a street lamp right next to it. So clearly they're in conversation with each other. Um, you know, to what extent do the lines match? Uh, I haven't looked into that. Um, but, you know, I think we can think of it as not just a whole scale project for water infrastructure, but this period indicating whole scale projects for all types of infrastructure and sort of understanding how those are connected, I think is going to be a larger project. Thank you. I can say very briefly, um, regulations usually uh, command that, that these infrastructures should go hand in hand. A neighborhood can be a neighborhood if it meets these criteria, including having sewers, having a postal service um, um, and other forms of a paved road, um, et cetera. But of course, in practice, it's usually not the case. But I think following regulations, we can uh, follow the mentality uh, is there to have these infrastructures to be in connection, but because all of these different infrastructural systems have their own very complicated histories connected to different companies, different, different uh, state actors, uh, in practice, uh, it's not uh, always the case. Um, thank you, Mehmet. And uh, another question uh, for uh, Sharon. Uh, from Gabriela Levy Haskell, uh, you beautifully demonstrated the aesthetic value of uh, portable water itself as an aspect of these fountains in your talk. I wonder whether you see this reflected in visual depictions of water as well, or is this particular to water in the context of the uh, fountains? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think, you know, I've mostly just looked at fountains, but to con to comment on visual depictions of them, what's interesting is, especially in the 18th century, you have these engravings of the fountains, sort of indicating a almost paradise-like 
uh, environments where the flowing of water, especially by European artists, is seen as something that Istanbul has achieved a paradise-like situation because in their own countries, they don't have flowing water in the same way. Um, so in visual depictions, there's an aesthetic connection between the water itself, sort of a paradisical understanding, and then the fountains as these ornate, beautiful objects. Um, and yes, so I think for the aesthetic understanding, there's just not only the visual, but the taste, as well as auditory, which is something you know I hope to get into later. Thank you. And I have a question for Sharon, if I may, and then I will leave it to Chris. Um, so you showed very nicely how these, you know, fountains were um, landmarks of modernization and investment and infrastructure and all that. But can you uh, reflect a little bit more on how these fountains uh, change the effect or the, you know, everyday life around them? Uh, everyday encounters around them, because you mentioned a little bit about charity and care, uh, but could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think maybe one parallel I can draw is Abdul Hamid also uh, patrons fountains in Kios, in Salonika, in Diyarbakir, in Izmir, and all over the Ottoman Empire. And when we think about, you know, what is the intent behind this sort of monumental construction and large scale constru construction, I think there is this idea that, you know, through drinking the water with Abdul Hamid's name on it, you are buying into the state either consciously or unconsciously. So that's, I think, the intention behind it. But what happens when people actually drink the water, interact with these spaces? Um, I think that's a little bit harder to access that kind of information. Um, but maybe, you know, I can look into memoirs um, and newspaper articles to sort of dig out what is the sort of individual experience between, you know, a, an individual drinking the water and the, the fountain that provides it. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And before I move to Chris, uh, we have a another question uh, about a, um, comment uh, from Professor uh, Neumann. I've just seen it, but I think it disappeared now. Um, because I replied it uh, through text, oh, that's probably why. It, it's in the answered column now. Sorry about that. OK. OK, but maybe. Um, OK, uh, maybe we, we should uh, read it out loud uh, for our audience as well. So uh, Professor Neumann's comment is like one of the most important uses of excrements was in leather production. I have encountered documents on people collecting excrements on the streets of the sixth municipal, municipal district professionally for the tanneries outside the city walls. And the practice was then newly regarded as a hygienic uh, problem. Uh, thank you. And um, so may I leave it to uh, Chris uh, if you have other questions or um, comments. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just sort of conclude with a couple of bigger picture questions to sort of position this, this work within the wider field of Ottoman studies. Um, so I sometimes get the impression that mainstream Ottoman studies, so you might think of sort of working on high politics, diplomacy, or even in social history, more conventional uh, forms of social history, might not immediately embrace environmental, infrastructural, or technological histories as being central to the field. Sometimes there's a sense that there's a marginality there in terms of the interest. So in other words, what does your work really do for the field? How does it capture something that these more conventional frames don't? Uh, so that's one question. A second question is more about periodization. Um, for the most part, the principal events and periodization in all of your papers takes place in the Hamidian period. I, I guess I would ask the question, is this coincidence? Why is that? Um, why does the Hamidian period lend itself to the study of infrastructure? And what's the larger point that an infrastructural reading of the late Ottoman, especially Hamidian era, uh, might hold for the field as a whole?
Okay, I can start. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Chris, for those questions. In regards to the first one, I think um, what I really find useful for looking at infrastructure, especially in the 19th century, is not just thinking about the Ottoman sort of culture, politics, and environment, but it also connects the Ottoman Empire to other locales and other sort of similar or parallel uh, developments that are happening where, you know, in the case of the Hamidia fountain itself is from a foundry that is supplying fountains to all over Europe at the same time. So I think it sort of opens the door for broader global conversations. Um, and in terms of your second question, why the Hamidian period? I think this is a multi-layered question. Well, first of all, as Professor Chalik said, it's a long time. Uh, it's, you know, 76 to, you know, early 20th century. Um, and secondly, you know, Abdul Hamid and his government is sort of engaging with a lot of uh, monumental uh, projects. Um, and I think that that sort of aspect of it, it's very sort of contingent on Abdul Hamid and his government itself. But at the same time, it's a period of cholera, of disease, of bacterial conversations, um, and it's a period of neoliberalism, sorry, proto of neoliberalism, of the you know, colonial uh, powers coming into these cities. So I think all these different things come together in this period. Um, I think regarding the first one uh, and following up uh, Sharon's uh, comments, it also connects uh, the, our stories, our histories to the people whose stories, people and uh, non-humans uh, whose stories we barely uh, hear in other histories. Uh, so, and I think all of these big histories that you mentioned, uh, conventional histories, they do talk about modernization and all of the cases that we are working on, they, they use those cases as examples or straightforward examples of modernization, but they rarely talk about what those modernization projects did to, let's say, the animals in Tarkos. So uh, we are, I think we are still working in the same universe, but uh, unearthing certain issues and voices that have been, uh, that have not really been looked at uh, in other, other histories. And for the Hamidian question, I should say, I think half of the projects or half of the things that I look at actually happen in uh, the Aziz period. So I don't want to um, take anything from his importance. Uh, but I, I mean, and uh, uh, other than what Sharon has said regarding the importance of Hamid's in infrastructural projects, all these monumental works, uh, I think there's also some convenience in being interested in late 19th century. Many of the things that bother us or excite us, or we, or that we see in our daily lives, they have, they, they can be easily traceable back to the 19th century. So in that, in that sense, I think it's uh, also a, there's a global, more general aspect to uh, that. Thank you, Chris. You are Sorry. muted. Sorry. You are muted. Before Amir responds, I wanted to just very briefly say something. I, I think that you're absolutely right, uh, Mehmet. Uh, but one thing that strikes me is there is a sort of question of matur maturation of the state. Uh, and you can sort of see this. I mean, I think in Sharon's paper, for example, it kind of the timeline and, and Mehmet's as well sort of matches some of the things that I find in my own work. By the time you get to the 1890s, some of these plans that had been hatched you know, uh, in the earlier, you know, Tanzimat period, they actually can come to fruition because the sort of layering uh, of the, both the infrastructural, but also the sort of technical human capacity uh, to sort of actuate those plans uh, really comes to fruition. So I think that there is kind of a, a practical matter um, that I think previous historians haven't gotten to in some respects because they're not looking at the material history in quite the same way. Uh, so I'll, let me just toss it back to Amir though. Uh, thank you for the uh, question, Chris. Uh, regarding first question, uh, infrastructural projects at the same time needed uh, 
big investments and capital and uh, studying uh, infrastructural projects uh, enable us to follow capital movements. It's, it doesn't need to be uh, money form, but at the same time, horses uh, were commodified. And for example, tramway, for tramway company, they uh, specifically bought from Hungary. Uh, for the uh, second uh, question, uh, I uh, agree with uh, Mehmet, uh, there is also a global uh, aspect because uh, our, uh, second half of the 19th century, may, until the World War I, many uh, cities uh, in the world witnessed dramatic changes. Yes. Thank you. So I believe that brings us to, to our conclusion. Um, so thank you again to everyone for joining us. I, I, I assume that Merve has some, uh, some comments. Uh, thank you, Chris. At this point, I would like to uh, turn it over to Professor Chevik uh, for uh, concluding uh, remarks. Thank you very much, all of you. This has been an extremely productive and sophisticated um, webinar. Um, and um, the, the, the discussions were really, really remarkable. Uh, as, you, as each one of you answered the questions, we realized how much more there is behind those 15 minute presentations, how much more you know how much more you thought about this and I think it's really relevant to the one of the last points that Chris made the field is changing and I think we are not wrong in identifying you as pioneers in this changing field what you present to us as Istanbul is so different than the Istanbul we studied several decades ago so thank you very much. I would like to remind everybody that we're going to have our third seminar um, on March 10th, and its title is Labor, Categories, Gender, and Everyday Life. You're going to find it very intriguing, a very different topic, but another truly engaging topic. So thank you all. Thank you very much for joining us.